Joined now by Jake Rowe of Dogs HQ, Georgia. We'll have its spring game on Saturday. It's one of those everybody wants to see because the Dogs, obviously one of the favorites to compete for the national title, as they have been pretty much every year of the Kirby Smart era. But, Jake, the way things ended last year, losing in the SEC championship game, playing in an Orange Bowl against a Florida State team that didn't want to be there, that didn't, didn't have most of its players, how bad does Georgia want to get back on the field and play in a new format where if what happened last year happens this year, they're still in the playoff and they still have a chance at the national title? Yeah, I think they're pretty fired up about it. And, and I think they're really fired up about the schedule because um, there's uh, there's there's no other way to be if you want to try to win a championship. You, you can't sit here and bellyache about that tough schedule, which is, you know, start the season against Clemson. You got Alabama in September at Alabama. You got Texas at Texas in October. Um, Ole Miss at Ole Miss in in, uh, in November. I mean, that, that, it's a very, very tough schedule. And, you know, Georgia getting Carson Beck back, all that stuff. I think that you're looking at a team that – you talk to some guys, and, and listen, I understand Florida State was decimated and, and didn't want to be there. But you were talking to those guys leading up to the Orange Bowl and losing their second game out of the past, you know, 45 just wasn't sitting well with them. You could tell they were frustrated by that, that they wanted to be in the playoff. They weren't entertaining this should we be in the playoff stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I think most people understand that, while Georgia didn't do what it took to get there, they were still probably, you know, most would agree, one of the four best teams in the country last year. And I totally understand why they didn't get there. They didn't deserve it. They didn't do what it took to earn their way there. They had an opportunity. They didn't do it. Um, but I think that this team has, has kind of had a sour taste in its mouth. And for the first time in a while, Kirby kind of gets to play the disrespect card. He kind of gets to play the, hey, you didn't do it. Hey, you know, this team didn't accomplish anything because it didn't. And and I think that's that's a key you know motivational factor. I always felt like Nick Saban was better in those years when he was coming off something like that, and it made the off season easier. And then with Georgia in this this particular off season, there's a Clemson game sitting there right off the bat that gives everybody reason to be excited, reason to, to feel like okay, you got to be ready right away. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that if you look and you kind of see when Georgia has, you know, come out of the gates the best, it has been with kind of a big opener. You know, it really has. And um, last year, you everybody, you know, was kind of saying it. I was saying it is this: the team looked a little bit bored. It looked a little bit, and and you know, right or wrong, and and you know, I. I'm not one of these guys that thinks that the team I cover, it has been for the last few years, is just this dominant team all the time and, and you know, glass half full all the time. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Georgia opened with – with you drew an Alabama comparison there. When Georgia opens with Oregon, Clemson, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of fire. There's a lot of – you see an elite, you know, uh, effort from Georgia from mm -hmm. the jump, and I think that's good for that football team when you combine – Clemson in the opener, plus what we talked about there with that kind of extra motivation in the offseason, I do believe that that it's it's the recipe for a Georgia team that can start fast. Oh, and, you know, again, you bring back a second-year starter at quarterback and a lot of veterans on this team too, especially in the trenches. Well, and, and so we just showed that schedule again. <laughs> at Alabama, at Texas, at Ole Miss, which uh, before we talk about Georgia in the spring, let's uh, – we'll, we'll give – we'll give some, some – Credit to uh, to Georgia AD Josh Brooks. I don't know how much of his fighting for this is is the reason that the SEC is just flipping the 2024 and the 2025 schedules. Uh, my suspicion is they didn't want to completely redo 2025 schedules because they're going to have to redo them again for 26. But that means that the the 2025 Georgia home schedule might be the greatest home schedule in the history of college football. It's it's definitely one of the best in school history. That that's a hundred percent correct. I mean, and you know, you knew you knew uh, you were hearing and and that that was going to happen. Not necessarily that it was going to get flipped, but that Georgia was going to get a pat on the back for for kind of the twenty twenty four schedule. Um, you know, I, I, I'm with you. I don't know how much the lobbying or anything like that had to do with it, but I tell you what, man, there there are a lot of donors at Georgia and a lot of guys, a lot of people that haven't donated over the years. They're going to be like, oh, well, I am I think this year I'm going to try to get those season tickets. Uh, it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be an absolute oh, yeah. tough one. 
they're gonna they're gonna pry some money out of you to get you those tickets. Not because the tickets are gonna cost that much, but because those point thresholds and all that stuff. If you don't know how that works, get season tickets in college football. It's a you know a lot of these schools have these long standing points and fun traditions mm-hmm. where you gotta donate a certain amount and. You know, it's it, that one is going to be pretty special, and that 2025 schedule is looking looking really nice. Well, and the other thing to consider, and this is if you're if you're a fan of a Georgia, of an Ohio State, of a of an Alabama, of a Penn State, of a Oregon, the the schools that we're talking about are probably going to be able to compete for the 12 team playoff every year. If you don't win your league, and and winning the 16 team SEC, winning the 18 team Big 12 or a Big 10 will be challenging. Like if you don't win your league, those types of schools are probably playing a home game in the playoffs. So you got to have season tickets to get into the door of that yeah. game too. Yeah, that's that's going to be wild. I, I it's it's such an unknown and I'm not a big college football playoff expansion guy. Um you know, I, I feel like just as I was starting to kind of fall in love with four, um they they expanded just it. ripped away. Yeah, just ripped it away. Uh but you know, it, I do think that the whole idea of college football game, a playoff game, a win in your, you know, a win and you advance, a lose and you go home being played on a, on a college campus, I, I can get down with that. I really like that part of it. And that's going to be a lot of fun, man. That is going to be so much fun. And, you know, I, I can see a lot of situations where Sanford Stadium might get opportunities like that because, like you said, it is so incredibly challenging to to go through these these gauntlets of schedules and you look at the way Georgia has scheduled in the future you know got a couple of home and homes with Clemson coming up over the next several years um got a home and home with I believe Ohio State Florida State you look at you know those plus you know you start talking about playing Texas and Oklahoma on your schedule um you know those it's going to be hard to win the league and and you know you may find yourself playing an extra game that extra game may be at home and it may be you know kind of once in a lifetime experiences in a lot of a lot of instances, or at least feel that way. So let's let's talk about this team that will take the field on Saturday for the spring game, but also th- this season. And you know, we can talk about the new guys, but I I want to ask about a guy who's been there, a fifth year guy, and I remember watching him last year in the SEC championship game. It's Arian Smith, the wide receiver, and obviously had the huge Peach Bowl against Ohio State a couple of years ago. But I, I looked out on the field in Atlanta. When they're playing Alabama, and I see Arian Smith out there, and I'm like, "Wait, he's still on the team?" And yes, he is. And now he's back for year five. Is this one of those situations where somebody who's kind of waited his turn, who's been through some stuff, might emerge in his last year? Yeah, I think that's very possible. And one of the things about Arian Smith is is that there there are a couple of things here. First, he had a hard time staying healthy. For three years, he had a hard time staying healthy. He finally stays healthy in his fourth year, and his confidence just kind of plummets. He has some drops, has some struggles. Uh, you know, it just wasn't great. It, it just it just wasn't. And I think that, you know, one of the things that Georgia has done this year, you know, that you hear about in the program is they, they've made a concerted effort, and, and Kirby even, you know, kind of used that word, um, they've made an effort as a staff to just kind of pour into this guy and be like, all right, listen, you know, this is, you know, the time, the top clock's ticking for you. You've got a world of ability. You're finally healthy. Let's pour into you. Let's get you ready. Let's show that we've got confidence in you, even if you may be struggling confidence on your own. I think that's been big for him this spring. Also think bringing on James Coley. Um, mm-hmm. Listen, I, James Coley doesn't have a ton of experience coaching wide receivers. It hasn't really been his primary position over the years, even though he's coached a lot of them. I think he's coached tight ends, running backs, quarterbacks, and receivers. Um, but he is his personality is great for what they really want to do um, and bring out of Arian Smith because James Coley is a positive, rah-rah in the best way, you know, kind of kind of gas you guys up a little bit. He he brings a lot of confidence to the table. And you know, one thing I'll say about this is he has had a fantastic spring on the practice field and in the scrimmages. Fantastic. There have been guys in the past, Matt Landers, who went on to Arkansas, um, Justin Robinson, who went to Mississippi State, who did things on the practice field, and it, it never really translated to the football field. This spring is the first time ever in Arian Smith's career, and I think injuries have had a little bit to do with that uh, and availability. First time I've ever heard a single peep about Arian Smith on the practice field. 
and it has been a fantastic. It's been a fantastic spring for him, and uh, he, he's made a lot of strides in it. You know, the funny thing is, Andy, and I don't want to get too inside baseball here, but is started in those first few practices, and you could kind of see it. We'd go out there for a media viewing period, and they would be, you know, Georgia would be running some sort of drill where they've got the receivers blocking on the edge. And this guy's just just selling out. Like it was obvious that it was like he was in, you know, fight mode, like right away. Mm -hmm. And I really think that there, there's a very good chance that Georgia has maybe pushed the right buttons here and gotten him going. Now, does that mean he's going to be the leading receiver? I would not bet on that. I, I mean, they Georgia's got Ra Ra Thomas and Colby Young's had a great spring. Uh Dominic Lovett's had a fantastic spring. Uh, they bring back a lot of receivers. Dylan Bell, maybe the best receiver they've got. Um, but Arian Smith, I think, is in for probably, um, you know, is on the trajectory to probably have his best season yet at Georgia. Well, and that's the question is with, with Ladd McConkey and, and Brock Bowers headed to the NFL, who is Carson Beck targeting the most? Do you think when we get now, obviously, spring game may be a little bit different because it, you'd be trying to work some different guys. But when, you, when it comes to that Clemson game, who do you think Carson Beck is going to be looking to throw to? Dom Lovett is the guy. And, and you know, it's funny, you know, you've heard a lot of Arian Smith buzz, big plays in scrimmages, big plays in practice. You've heard a lot of Colby Young. Man, this guy's a, a transformer. I mean, he's there's somebody inside him driving him because that's how big and freakish he is. And he's made a lot of plays. And, and you've heard some even some murmurs about, oh, well, you know, Colby Young was best player on the field today. Um, Dominic Lovett has been a steady thread throughout this entire spring for Georgia. He was Georgia's second leading receiver last year. And if you go back and look, I, th I thought this was really interesting. I did it here recently. If you go back and look at the games where Brock Bowers came out early, missed significant time, or missed games, Lovett was fantastic. I think it was something around five to six catches for on average for about 60 yards a game. And, you know, that's something, you know, you, you push that over the course of a, you know, 13, 14, 15 game season, you're looking at an eight, 900 yard receiver. And that was in year one with a new quarterback that he had never played with. He wasn't the first option. Brock Bowers was the first guy out there. And then he wasn't even the second option when Ladd McConkey got healthy. So you're, you're talking to, in, in my opinion, you're talking about a guy who you've got a big, strong arm quarterback that likes to throw the ball over the middle of the field. You got a really talented veteran slot receiver with with all the you know ability in the world. Um, I, I would say Dominic Lovett is probably going to be Georgia's go to guy. Well, and and that's it. Feels like they've got plenty of options because obviously Oscar Delp comes in at tight end, a little di different look than than Brock Bowers, but that he's got plenty of experience. I, I want to go to the other side of the ball uh, to the defense. Tell me a little bit about C.J. Allen and what he's done this spring at linebacker. You know, C.J. Allen, you didn't hear much about him to begin with, and C.J. kind of looks like if you just watch him, right, if you just say, all right, I've got my eyes on – he was number 33 last year, he's number three this year. You see a guy that almost looks a little bit like an old-school linebacker because he's he seems to be carrying about 230, 235 pounds. Um, he, he's kind of – looks like a downhill thumper, but he's a fantastic mm -hmm. athlete. Played running back in high school. He's really good. Um, I, I think he kind of struggled adjusting to some of the nuances of the position last year. And you saw some bad run fits. Like you go back to that Tennessee game when when they broke the 75-yard run on the first play of the game, and he runs himself completely out of the play. Well, he's, he's gained a lot of confidence um, over this spring as a, as a run defender. But he's also a very, very good pass defender. And that's something that's really started to kind of come out with him, especially in these scrimmage settings. Well, and – I feel like teams are kind of going back to that. Uh, you know, Alabama has Deontay Lawson, who's a, a similarly built kind of linebacker. And uh, it, it feels like you kind of have to do that because because teams have gone a little heavier in the run game as as the game has evolved. Defense has got really light. So offense has started to get heavier again. And it feels like George is ready to to be prepared for that. Yeah. And, and I, you know, funny thing is I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, offenses, I feel like, have gotten a lot more creative in terms of uh, against defenses like the ones Georgia plays, where Georgia likes to cover up all the offensive linemen and let the linebackers run free. And, and, and a lot of these run scheme things have been designed around, okay, let's get a lineman free so that we can get a body on a guy at the second level. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're trying to kind of counter that as a defense. You've got to have a, a, a somebody that can step up and snap a guard's head back and, 
and make a play. And I think that's something that Georgia is dealing with there. And, and I, I expect Georgia to be, you know, I, you know, listen, Georgia took a step back and this is, this really speaks to how good Georgia was up front in 2021 and 2022, but Georgia took a step back on the defensive line last year and probably still had a top five to eight off defensive line in the country. Sorry. They, they took a step back on the defensive line and had a top five to eight defensive line in the country. I think they're going to be better this year than they were last because you got Jeremiah Hall, a former five-star prospect. You've got Kristen Miller. Uh, all of these guys are going into their second years being major contributors. Also, Georgia brings back a couple of fifth-year guys who you know played significant roles on a couple of national championship teams. And I think that front seven for Georgia, especially when you factor in you know, guys like Michael Williams and Tyron Ingram Dawkins, uh, Gabe Harris, uh, all of the depth and linebacker, I mean, they're going at it without Smile Monday and inside linebacker because he's dinged up this spring. Um, that Georgia front seven, I feel like, it just in general, it is going to be kind of back on par to what Georgia's, you know, considering to be its standard there, and, and at least a little bit closer to what it was last than what it was last year when they were so dinged up and so young. So one thing it feels like we've seen in the NIL and portal era is schools like Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama. It's harder to keep the depth that they used to have. That that yeah. used to be the kind of the prohibitive advantage that they had. And you saw Florida State kind of raid the cupboard when it came to to Alabama and Georgia this offseason where they're, they're pulling starters from guys that were going to be competing for, for spots at Georgia and Alabama. So for Georgia, how deep are they relative to those teams in, in 18, 19, 21, 22, you know, where they they felt like they were the deepest team in college football? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's marginal, but it's still important. And I don't know if that, that, that's almost like oxymoronic to say that, but it's, you're talking about a player or two and that can mean a lot. Um, you know, it, it really, now your depth is younger than it's ever been because you're, you're, and a lot of times you, you talk about, all right, well, you got four defensive tackles or, or, you know, five defensive tackles, you know, your, your fifth or sixth guy that's going to play 10 to 12 snaps a game for you is going to be a freshman, redshirt freshman type. That's just the way it is. You don't – Alabama did – Alabama built such a such a juggernaut off the back of having guys like Quinn and Williams stick around for – you know, stick around and bide their time for two years and then explode in year three. You know, that was one of the things that made them so great is they were able to stockpile that. Quinn Williams isn't waiting around for three years in today's college football. He's just not going to do it. He's going to go somewhere and play some ball and and, and get drafted high. So, you know, I think that what you're seeing from Georgia, they brought in a big D line class this past year, you know, speaking to that position specifically, they're not going to be as deep and as experienced as they were, especially in 2021. 2021 was just a unicorn type of, I mean, that, that team had four first round defensive linemen on it. I don't know <laughs> if we'll ever see that again. And, and no. they get the portal stuff reined in completely and, and start getting these, you know, start paying these guys and getting them on two or three year contracts or whatever. I just don't think you're going to see it again, especially when you when you're looking at, um, you know, all the experience there. I mean, the four guys first round, two drafts. That that's kind of what it broke down to be, and that's that is going to be extremely difficult to do now. This was a big line of scrimmage recruiting class. Mm -hmm. Who among those freshmen do you think might get to see the field? Obviously, it's it's Georgia, so it's a little bit harder to get on the field as a freshman, but. But who this spring is, has shown signs that they might be able to pull it off? Offensively, you got Daniel Calhoun, who's working at guard. Um, and, and you know, you, you, I say that, and, and I'll preface it by saying this. There's there's talk out of Georgia, out of the building there at Georgia, that this is the best interior group of offensive linemen that Kirby Smart has had since, since he's been at Georgia. They're really good wow. at tackle, too. But, you know, if you look back at some, kind of some, even the best teams, they've kind of had a really good guard. And a and a and, a, and a, a really good guard or a really good pair of guards, and then they were trying to figure it out at center, or they had a really good guard in the center, and the, and the other guard spot was maybe not necessarily a weak, not necessarily a weak link in a, in a you know pejorative or or a negative sense, but a weak link because there's got to be one, and he's probably the guy. Well, now with Micah Morris, Dylan Fairchild, Tate Ratledge, they feel like they are are set at guard, and they're really excited about Jerry Wilson at center, but. To, to put all that together, Daniel Calhoun, with all of that going on, has still been able to generate some buzz. It's kind of getting some second-team work. 
mammoth human being, six six. He reported like three hundred seventy pounds. He's already into the three thirties, three forties. Um, that I know Georgia feels really good about those offensive of linemen they took because so many of them needed to come to campus and drop weight, and all of them did. And that was that was very important. You I think if you're Stacy Searles, you're thinking maybe I recruited the right type of guy for them to come in and do that. Um, but then you look over to the defensive side of the ball. That's always tougher. I feel like defensively, the closer you are to the football, uh, Rusty Mansell and I have talked about this many times, the closer you are to football, the harder it is to make an impact on day one. But Joseph Jonah Ajanye, um, he's he's gotten a lot of reps this spring because Ty Ingram Dawkins has been out with a, with a foot injury and Michael Williams moved to outside linebacker. So you're talking about a freshman who all, on the hoof, looks the part six four you know 270 pounds 275 pounds is everything you want but he doesn't even turn 18 until november so he's, <laughs> he's he is a young guy you know he's, he's going to play his first college game um at 17 years old but there's a lot of excitement about him and i would say he probably has the best chance based on position because he plays d end and not nose or or defensive tackle but uh you know the position and just raw talent he's got a chance to help him right away so you mentioned Tate Ratledge in that group of interior offensive linemen. Uh, Tate Ratledge, fellow podcaster, host of the, the Real Talk podcast. It, is, it was a good show when he and Rylan Goaty started it. It was a pretty good show last year when Zion Logue, the D lineman, took over for Rylan after he transferred to Mississippi State. The new host, the new co-host, though, Brett Thorson, the yeah. Australian punter. I'm worried. I'm worried that these guys are just going to blow us off the map. Yeah, I am too, man. I am too. Like I, I listen. They've they've you much so less than me. All right, like you you tasted it. Like you got a chance to play a little college ball and get yelled at by a college coach and stuff like that. This is we need these guys to stay out of this. I'm much more worried about these guys than I am AI. That is a hundred percent fact. Like I mean, they're, Brett Thorson gets a chance to play college football in front of hundreds of thousands of fans. And he's going to be funnier, more engaging, and 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 better at this than I am. An I Australian, the that's accent's a killer. <laughs> yeah, that's not even fair, man. It just it doesn't it doesn't work out right. I mean, it's we need these guys to understand that. Just leave some for the rest of us, okay? Just, just <laughs> yeah. leave, let let us have a little bit too. We all need to survive in this world. It, it, it all all kidding aside, if you haven't listened to Real Talk, it's it's hilarious, and they take you very deep inside the game it, it's funny because I, I remember talking to tate a couple years ago about it and he said oh you know kirby smart's a pretty tough editor <laughs> so you wonder what may, what doesn't make the, the show but it feels like they like they get you inside of georgia practices inside of those games and it is it's a lot of fun so we'll, we'll have to have them on to uh to regale us with some stories in the off season but yeah adding the australian part of the mix is just not fair it's not, but I'll say this about the Kirby Smart being a tough editor part. Um, I had I, I ran into someone here recently that told me about spending a couple of days with Kirby Smart, and I don't know that – I mean, they're going to have to go to a 30-hour day before the man's got time to edit a podcast. I do know that. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't know that – I think Kirby may have a editor by proxy on that whole thing, but um, they. I don't think that they can blame any sort of – can't let those guys use excuses and, and blame Kirby for for uh, any show that's lacking in entertainment because I don't think the I don't think the visored ninth year head coach has a whole lot of time to to get comb back through. Heck, I, I don't even have the attention span to comb back through the podcast. Not not in this day and age. Not in this day and age. Kirby Smart has a lot on his plate, and uh, I guess the last question because with Georgia last year, Bear Alexander was kind of the big name that entered the transfer portal in the spring window throughout the country. Like he's probably the biggest name of the country that entered the, the spring transfer portal window. Any worries that Georgia might have some guys popping in after this uh, over anything other than playing time. Cause I think if that, if it's playing time, there's, there's really not much you can do about it at this point, man, this is yes. I, and I'm not, I don't know. I, I, I can honestly tell you, I have not heard of one guy, not one specific guy, that that you would have to be worried about that with but um that's what we're dealing with now right that's that's where you're at is it's one of those situations where um law of averages you call it what you want just kind of leading the dove you know whatever you got to say here it's one of those things it's kind of like uh 
do I know of anything specific on the horizon at this point? No. Um, is it likely to happen? Yeah. Is there, there is likely something to happen there. And this is because that's the way it is. And, and, you know, every, everybody, almost everybody, you look in the two windows, almost everybody's going to lose somebody they don't want to lose. And, and yeah. that's, that's the way this goes now. And, um, you know, with and I don't even call it tampering. I, I just don't know that there's a better word for it. It's what has to happen. Um, you know, these. Yeah, it's, it's the only way it actually works, because yeah. the timing of it is so compressed that. Yeah, everybody knows, like every yeah, personnel yeah, guy Kirby knows. Mentioned it, Kirby mentioned it, I think, during bowl, bowl uh, interviews or something like that. He said, uh, in my experience, guys don't transfer unless they know where they're going. And so yeah. it's 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 kind of one of those deals that. Everybody has to kind of figure it out and and you know get a head start on it. Um, so with with all of that going on, um, you know the whole negotiation process starts taking place before the portal window even opens, and then you know ultimately you can think you've got a guy back in the fold five, six, seven, a dozen times, and next thing you know he's showing up in your office um, saying that somebody gave him a better deal, and that's you know that it's the wild west. I, I, on one hand, I can understand how. I'm not built for it. And I would say, you know, to hell with this and I'm done um, and, and kind of throw my hands up and just let the guy go. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm not making a lot of money doing this, though, because these guys, <laughs> they, they, they keep they keep at it. They're really competitive. And I think well, and, and, and what Georgia does better than most is they value retention. They know who they want to keep. Like yeah. a couple of years ago, Marius Rims, that's a guy you want to keep. Yeah. And, and they made sure they kept him. That that really is the name of the game. So it feels like they figured that part out and aren't willing to overextend on the freshmen, that sort of thing. So it'll it'll be an interesting week or so because you can kind of tell who who values who yeah. <laughs> when, when all this stuff is going on. One hundred percent. And and listen, I expect Georgia to be active in trying to add. Um, you know, we were we were having a discussion on the Georgia show the other day and. Um, Rusty made the comment, hey, uh, you know, if they if a guy goes in, if they was, we were talking about quarterbacks, if a quarterback goes in that they feel like can help them, he we fully expect Georgia to be in the transfer portal market. We've said that for months. I, I definitely think there's the odds are high that Georgia's going to add a quarterback because they like having four quarterbacks in that room if they can find a guy that that they like enough and is willing enough mm -hmm. you know, willing to come. But that's – you could say that about every position uh, since Kirby Smart's been at Georgia. They – they have gone out and gotten grad transfers before we had the one-time transfer rule to help them right away. Um, did it with with you know um, Maurice Smith and Jay Hayes mm -hmm. from Notre Dame. Um, they've they've done it since the portals open, and I expect Georgia to be in the market for quarterback, maybe D line, um, in, in this 15 day window, and and they're going to be at it. And listen, Georgia's got to lose some guys to the portal because once this, the rest of this 2024 class shows up, Andy. They're, I think they're at 88 scholarships, so they got to chew some down anyway. And if they want to add some more via the portal, they got to lose even more than that. That's right. If you haven't won a job yet by the spring game, <laughs> maybe time to look elsewhere. Jake Rowe, thank you so much. Anytime, bud. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder: subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on Three. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.